I'm Doug Jones, and you have discovered Beyond Trek Podcast. A red alert. Hey, Jay. Hey, Dag. A spider fell on me while I was sleeping last night. The spider, a spider fell on you while you were sleeping. Why, yeah. why is that? I, it's not a joke. I was sleeping as like midnight and then I felt something fall on my shoulder and crawl down my arm. And Ooh. I was, was, was more awake than I've ever been, uh, hopping out of bed. It was like, I summoned my phone to me in flashlight mode and just scanned, scanned the bed with this light. And I saw it and I grabbed this disposable mask that I had next to my bed and just uh-huh. smashed it. And threw it away. <laughs> That was probably the worst way to be woken up was with a spider crawling yeah. on you. <laughs> like I, I mean, I can, I can, I can imagine worse, mm-hmm. but in, in, in reality, uh, it's gotta be up there. Spider falling on you while you're sleeping is terrifying. Oh God. <sighs> Jeez. <laughs> um, well, ho- hopefully we'll be able to talk about something that's not so scary for you. <laughs> Oh, you mean like flowers? I love flowers. Yeah, like, well, uh, unfortunately, no, not not flowers, but Star Trek Discovery, season three, episode two. Oh, yeah. And Far from it, home. The one without Spider-Man. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Yeah. Star Trek Far From Home. Yeah, and I like the I like the Spider-Man reference there. I wonder, I'm sure they knew what they were getting into doing that with that episode title, but wasn't it wasn't supposed to be um uh, named after the uh, 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 first the episode, hope is you. yeah, the hope is you part two, and what what happened there? Um, so the producers decided to change the title of the episode last minute, and by the time they did that, all the publicity material had gone out for it. Mm-hmm. Um, all the wikis had been updated and stuff like that. So by the time the episode aired, some of the wikis had it, some of them didn't. Some of them actually had both names in the same column for that episode. Okay. Um, you know, it was just a matter of how do we get this through? And honestly, you know, having watched the episode, I don't really think the hope is you really fits the tone of this episode. I do think far from home definitely captures the overall urgency of the crew. If we're talking about like Saru's scene or what's going on on the rest of the ship, um, that there was definitely a, a fish out of water feeling they were far from home right yeah yeah you're you're right and it's it's a shame but you know those those things happen but uh so with with this episode spoiler spoiler alert spoiler alert alert. we get to see discovery's viewpoint uh from from their perspective on on what's happening and oh boy was that a heck of a uh, uh, intro oh yeah i mean very much like the last episode where michael just flies into the unknown and crashes into uh the nautilus you've got discovery barreling through the time vortex as well smashing into you know floating rocks above the planet and ultimately uh, as you can see here yep <laughs> um, into a a an area of parasitic ice and there was something really cool here that that I don't think we've seen in 34 years. Um, at the beginning of the episode, everybody is asleep, knocked out, and the the, the rocks next to Saru are like kind of moving. And my first thought was, "Oh no, control made right. crap the nanites." Um, but they're not. It's just it's the vibration, and it was a really cool choice of like having sound be absent so that the crews like we're with the crew as they kind of wake up and then jet Mm -hmm. talks about how like the reason we were all we all fell asleep was because of the tidal forces from the event you know from the temporal anomaly right when did we see another crew time traveling and they fell asleep in their time travel jay that was star trek four the voyage home right and they never talked about it it was always just some kind of cool mystical effect of the time travel we didn't actually get like a thoughtful com- a sense thing about it. And, and so now we can kind of say, hey, if it happened to Discovery here, that's probably what happened to Kirk on the Bird of Prey. And that that was the thing I'll, I'll just mention about that in Star Trek IV just real fast was that, uh, so they fall asleep going back into the past, but not going back to the future. So- They do. 
They do. Do they though? It, yeah. When when the bird of prey emerges, um, it it kind of just like goes fades to white, and then you know Kirk sort of comes out of it and he says, "Did breaking thrust? Did breaking thrusters fire?" And Sulu's like, yes, sir, they have. And he's like, so where are we? And then the probe sound wah, comes wah, over. Wah, 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 yeah. Wah, wah. Okay. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So but yeah. So I, when they go back, you get mm-hmm. all those little tidbit visions of the future. Right. And the sound right. effects and stuff like that. But yeah, it, it's just, it's abbreviated when they go back to the future. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But I, I, did, I did like that, that callback that they did with that, with that here, because the, uh, yeah, Jet said that the, it's like G forces except worse. Yeah. which I can, I can only imagine. And uh, once they come through that portal, I mean, they're coming in hot. <laughs> it's like we are, yeah. we are going down right now. Yeah. And now, so here's, here's what I didn't, what I didn't get. And it didn't really hit me on the first episode, but it did with, with this one, when they were going through the portal at the uh, end of the second season of, of discovery, they weren't around any planet, but yet coming out of this portal, not only are they in the future, but in a different location. I didn't, I didn't get that because you, usually that's not how we've seen time travel to work is, is that when you do travel in time, you're, you go either forward or backwards in time, but you don't also go to a whole other location as well. And as I'm saying that, I am, I'm recalling that that might not, I don't know if we can count that as, as that's the case, because I, I just remember that when that happened to Star Trek 2009, when um, the Narada went through the anomaly, both with he and Spock, neither one of them ended up uh, anywhere near this, Romulus, right? Nowhere near that, that, that place. Okay. So yeah, I may have been well, about contradicting and- myself. One of the things that I've been thinking about for time travel in the sort of same sense as like Back to the Future is, you know, Back to the Future was a lot of, was really fun, but the DeLorean kept appearing around Earth and there had to be something more at play in order for it, the DeLorean to disappear around Earth in 1985 and Earth still be in the same place in 1955. That's totally not possible. Right. But yep. with, with Star Trek 2009 and Discovery in this moment, um, you, you, you can maybe just say, you know what, the galaxy is just not the same place after 950 years. Um, mm-hmm. yep. you know, and I'm sure there's an astrophysicist out there listening. Who's like, well, technically, you know, the galaxy has moved far beyond where, you know, even time travel into the same galaxy would be difficult. Like, okay, that makes sense. But for all intents and purposes, creatively time travel really isn't consistent in star Trek when you get to the nitty gritty. Um, Correct. I, I One of the like things is probably the least consistent with. Right. We know how to get from our time to another time, but the the different effects that get us there are are different, inconsistent, mm. pro, pro, possibly unreliable. Um, so yeah, those are things that happen. Okay. Yeah, that was that's my observation. Was so suddenly we are crashing into a planet that should not have been there, but oh well. That's that's what's driving. The story is they need to be at the place, so they're at the place. Yep. And uh, an, an icebound crash, kind of like what Voyager did in. Um, so I, I know it was season six, but I'm I'm not recalling the name I of the should episode. Remember, but I know I know the episode you're talking about, where they're at uh, QSD and they come out and they crash into the planet. Yeah. Right. Right. Yep. And then uh, Harry and Chakotay take the Delta mm-hmm. flyer to rescue them and go back in time or send a message to seven to nine back in time to, uh, uh, to cut the cord on the, on the experiment. Yeah. Yeah. So another ice crash for a, for a ship, which and beautiful scene. It's the fourth, it's the fourth hero ship crash on a planet in four years. Tech, and, and, and interestingly enough, it's the third hero ship crash on a planet in one year. So we had uh, Star Trek Beyond, yep. the Enterprise died. That's right, Beyond. In, in Picard, La Serena was taken down by a flower. Yep. Mm-hmm. In Lower Decks, Cerritos crashed on a planet in that holodeck program, yep. uh, Rise of, of Invicta. R- R- Rise uh, of Vindicta. Vindicta, thanks. I keep yep. doing it wrong. <laughs> and then, of course, Discovery, 
Ta-da! Crashing on this planet. We need um, to keep these ships from crashing, damn it. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and that's another thing is, so they crash, mm -hmm. and right when they get to the top, everybody flies forward, Detmer gets real injured, don't know what's going on with Detmer, but how come... How come the inertial dampeners always work in space, but they don't work when we crash? <laughs> well, the way you're right, you're right. Here's the way that I that I took that was that um, they they were working, but even at full capacity, which I'm sure they were not. That is a a very sudden impact. Well, I, I mean, it's take take any any battle. Um, anytime there's a phaser or torpedo hit, the ship is rocking. So, you know, the inertial dampeners are going to do that. They're, they're, they're not ever so perfect that they can even keep you from jerking in your chair when the shields get hit. So yeah, I can, I can definitely say that they were, they were for sure working and working as intended, which means you're going to get some movement and impact just not nearly what it would be like if you didn't have them at all, or if they were uh, not at least close to ah, to full capacity. So you're saying you're saying if they didn't have the inertial dampeners, they all would have been paced up against the view screen. Yes. Okay. No, that makes sense. yes. I because I mean, look look how look how fast they were coming in. Now they were, they were able to break that descent a little bit there with the Graphic shooting the ice. deflectors into the ass, uh, the ass, the ice, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whoops <laughs> Weep. Weep, yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh but right but yeah yeah it could it could have been a lot worse um i love jet i love jet i love jet this is the first episode of discovery i've caught on first day like the last really? episode yeah the, the the first episode of the season i got two days later but this okay. was the first episode where like i woke up this morning i got my coffee i sat down i watched discovery nice um i love jet i love tig nataro i listened to her episode on the pod directive uh she's my absolute hero uh tig is uh, oh she's funny and and the character what she the life that she gives to jet jet really is like the miles o'brien of this show oh and, she is yes and i love it so much well and, and plus she she brings in that kind of that gruff comedy that, that I really like sort of the, the, the dry wit. Uh, that's, that's good. Uh, she, she's going to be pretty snappy with the, with the one liners. And the, the thing that I like about it is, is that's totally her character, like right off the bat introduced from day one, you knew that was going to be, which was great foresight is to have a character already primed to be the one that, delivers and I, I hate to say comic relief because it's not comic relief it's not a, you know the goofy jim carrey funny it, it's it's that it's good humor but you know it's that very it's also very like gruff a reality dry. check yes yeah, she doesn't pull any punches she tells it like it is she's not cruel or mean about it that's right. just the way things are yeah yeah add, add some some realism to the to the situation so She's getting her uh, got herself fully integrated with the uh, with the crew, and yeah, I, I I watched the episode first day as as well. Um, so it's it's a it's a little more fresh, and they're all now. Detmer's acting pretty funny, which yeah, that's got me suspicious. You know, little Detmer sus. A little, I was a little worried that like maybe Control got her implant, but then her accident was like right after they, they landed. She flew over her console, smashed into the floor, cut her head. I'm very mm -hmm. worried about her. They said she didn't have a concussion when they looked at her. Um, and while this speculation is great and everything, this is another one of those moments. And there's another yeah. one later with Stamets where the main character like, ignores the problem that's right in front of their face or mm -hmm. denies the problem right in front of their face to move forward in such a way. Um, I, I really hope this isn't a case of why didn't you just take your cell phone out and call one of those plot holes where it's like, you, you clearly something's wrong. Stamets goes into the Jeffrey's tube. He's bleeding to death. Like Stamets, seriously. I, I actually wrote in my notes, damn it, Stamets. 
Um, <laughs> you know, but it's it's those moments where it's like, yeah, you you guys really are pushing yourself too far, and it's almost like you're avoiding the the medical treatment. Your, yes. your lust for adventure is overriding the the fact that you're bleeding out and overriding common sense. Yeah. So um, I'm I, as as interested as I am in knowing what's up with Detmer. I really hope that it isn't some kind of lame plot hole. I, I really, yeah, you, you're right. I mean, the, to me, and I'm not a doctor, I, I, I got my medical degree from Google. It, she, she, she's looking and acting concussed, but I, I think there is going to be something deeper that happens. However, uh, it's, it's not going to be control related. I, I really feel like that that was, that whole storyline was a, a clean cut mission success. We're in the future. There's life and we're done. We're, we're moving forward. Dunzo. Right. Dunzo. Dunzo. Yeah. Yeah. There's something else uh, going on there, but you know, just a, just an observation that I, yeah. well, that we all noticed there with, with that. So while everybody's on the bridge, sort of stunned, sort of looking around, sort of trying to discuss what do we do now? Do we leave Discovery? Do we fix Discovery? Mm -hmm. Suja, Saru just is on the spot with the, the motivational speech. Um, he even says uh, towards the end of it, you know, our first priority is in here. Totally Riker vibes. Totally my first duty is to the ship. Yes. Um, I liked that a lot. Uh, I am biased. Saru is my favorite character in Discovery. Um, well, just look <laughs> at how he stepped up. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. He he's really had to rise to a lot of challenges, and he sort of filled the filled the gap there, especially for somebody who came from a species that was sort of artificially subdued and oppressed into thinking it was a prey species. Correct. And right. he gets such a badass moment in this episode and we'll get there. <laughs> oh, yeah, I like, can't wait to get there. <laughs> I like, I was drooling. It was so cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. And then this episode also had its life epiphany when they, you know, in the last episode, when uh, Michael is asking the suit before she sends the suit off, is there life? Is there life? Is there life? And the suit says, yes. And she's like, yes, yes we did it. We made it to the future. And this episode also has that moment when yep. uh, Tilly detects that settlement and there's life and everyone just looks around and they're like, we did it. It's a relief that it wasn't, that it wasn't for nothing. Right. Yeah. And they get their moment of that as well, which is really, really cool. Right, it it was, and then they they jump right into uh, uh, assessing the the damage on the uh, on the ship and splitting up the teams. Uh, or you you have to help me out. Help me out. I'm sure you got the the timeline. There uh, was the conference room chit chat with Saru, Jet, uh, Giorgio, Giorgio, and uh, and Tilly before they all split up. So um, my notes are sort of in order here. Okay. And right. um, where we get to after they realize that, you know, life, and maybe I didn't take effective notes, I don't know. Um, but where I went to after this was uh, Stamets quiet on his bed. In, yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, in the... He's in the infirmary trying to in recover. Infirmary. And the room is silent. And he's there and the camera sort of peers over him mm -hmm. and then all the noise comes in and Culber's there and the camera pans back and the, 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 it's a hub of activity. And it was just another one of those like moments to like, I don't know if it's an editing choice or a cinema, cinematographic choice, but mm -hmm. just like in the beginning where everything's quiet and Saru's laying on the ground and the rocks are sort of tumbling around him. And as he wakes up, the sound comes back for Stamets. It's quiet. It's silent. There's like no sense of any activity around him. And then suddenly he's back and the whole sick bay is just a buzz. Um, people are calling out, you know, vitals and I need this medicine and help me over here. And Culver's trying to like wake him up and he's like, Hey, I'm going to give you this thing. And I really liked that choice of direction for that scene. I thought it was really, yeah. uh, it helped us get into Stamets head visually. 
Right, right. It it did. It did. That was that was good. And from from what he's trying to recover from, I mean, that was uh, that was a pretty righteous injury that he had. So yeah, he's yeah, he's been he got, laid up in a coma. Yeah, he got uh, he got damaged. He got rocked pretty hard. Yep. Uh, trying to get that suit out the door in the last season. Um, I love Stamets and Colbert's dynamic. I love the fact that Colbert is like, you better stay alive because I'm going to kill you later. Um, <laughs> and, and, and then he kisses him and it's, it's just yeah. like, yes, this is, this is a good relationship. This is solid. They're mm-hmm. not, he's not really threatening to kill him. He's just like, I love you so much. Don't you freaking do this to me. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> And we, right, we've we've heard that one. You, you you better live through this so I can kill you myself. <laughs> right, right. It's that sort of cheeky. I'm gonna vent a little bit, but I love you kind of thing. Yep. <laughs> um, you know, and then we get the scene where the doctor does the dermal regenerator on um, on Detmer's head and says, "Yeah, you don't have a concussion. You're fine." And Detmer's just sort of standing around, and the doctor's like, "Is there anything else?" And she's like, "Uh, no." And I'm like, "Rule number one for Starfleet: Whenever your person is not like hardcore, like, oh no, I'm fine," you'd be like, "Wait a second, yes, you're off duty." Just <laughs> go. <laughs> I have I have read all of the Enterprise's logs. Every time somebody <laughs> says, every time somebody hesitates, there's always something wrong. It's like I'm not gonna get. I'm not going to get sprayed in the face by a venom sack from a de-evolving Klingon. This isn't going to happen. If you don't answer me immediately, I'm putting you in stasis. That's just how this works. <laughs> you have one second to answer or my phaser will be in my hand. <laughs> answer wisely. Yeah, yeah, you're you're right. Well, that, that's the, the hazards of being in Starfleet. <laughs> yes, I'm with, yeah. they're okay. They get a split second to respond. Otherwise, they are in restraints. Um, yeah, you know what? I think you're right though. I think that, um, that ready room sequence, cause the table smashed, I think that happens right. around here. I don't have any specific notes for it other than the game of chess that Giorgio is playing with Saru in that moment. Oh, right, right. Well, and she's, she's the kind of person in that uh, personality because remember she's from the mirror universe where everything's tough you're someone's always trying to kill you and and move up you you've, you've got to be one step ahead of of everybody uh and then there's there's a lot of a lot of toughness a lot of sharpness there and there is a lot of headbutting because the way she does things is very different than how than how saru does it not to mention she's taking orders from lunch you know, orders from uh, what's a walking delicacy to, to the yeah, universe. Right. To her. Right. 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 Yeah. So it's, it's like, okay, I'm, I'm listening to you, but uh, you know, it wasn't several months ago that, uh, you know, your, your people was, was a delicacy uh, uh, to me. So that's probably got her. I, I mean, there's, that's a whole other level. There's there's people that you have doing slave labor, and then there's the the knowing consumption of people. Like how how far down on your respect list do you have to have someone where you you boil them up like a lobster and and serve them for dinner? Now this person's telling you what to do. Yeah, definitely one of. Uh, one of the moments where the audience is like, we know where these two came from. Mm-hmm. There might be a showdown someday. And I actually wrote that down. I was like, you think Saru can take Giorgio? <laughs> mm-hmm. But now that we know he has a ranged weapon attack, <laughs> <laughs> which again, we'll talk about that in a minute. Right. Um, and, and she's, she's really uh, not, not only trying to butt heads with, with Saru, but she has she has taken to um, to negging pretty much anyone around her, and especially especially Tilly. Like she's, I don't know what this uh, this this thing is. This this uh, you know, don't don't want to call it a grudge, but just sort of this just starts chafing everyone uh, around her. Which okay, that that's good. Let's let's build up some some drama for the for the season. Uh, she starts rubbing people the, the wrong way, but um, I love, love, loved Tilly's reaction after uh, another time that Giorgio threw a pun at her. She's like, what the? F-? 
the roots of the mountain. <laughs> you know, and there was a funny moment in this scene too, when uh-huh. Saru's like, Ensign Tilly, you're gonna come with me. And Tilly was like, Well, why are you picking me? And 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 Nan was like, Yeah, why are you picking Tilly? Yeah, shit, her. <laughs> I didn't mean to say it. And then it, it, yeah, no, she's like, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just it was a human moment it was yes. a human moment it's like it's like you're it's not that you're not qualified it's that like non is a commander and 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 tilly's an ensign and there's an experience factor when it comes right. to having to go into a first contact situation um and of course that experience factor ends up paying off badly for saru we get there in a minute but right um, well i think it's also you've you've you're in a situation where you have to be um conservative with your officers and and your rank because you've you've got saru who's the acting captain you've got uh, many members of the of the crew injured not really at at 100 percent you've got to look at all right who who here in this room has the experience to lead if if the shit goes south so i i get what you're saying about if if you go by rank and experience he should have brought non but if things do go south he's going to need her to be the one to to take command um she may not be next in command in regards to uh, the chain of command but however it's it's one of those you don't take your two of your and we're not going to count Giorgio. he doesn't doesn't trust her he's, there's no way in hell that he would put her in a position where she would be in command of the ship so if you subtract her you don't have a lot of experience command in front of you it's 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 you and commander non you don't want to have two of your higher ranking officers like that yeah off the ship at the same time it, it's you're you're in a scenario where you've got to take you've got to leave someone that you can trust to take charge there in case something happens so i get i get that it was it was tilly just by virtue of well <laughs> don't let two you know. of the high ranking flag officers get shot down and leave somebody leave giorgio in charge right right y- yes yeah. yes well and, and that's yeah that's the other thing is um needing to leave someone behind that can handle her and, and if anyone's right. going to be able to handle uh, Giorgio, it's uh, Saru and and Nan. Like that. I mean, that's that's it. Yeah. So right, I, I can I can see why he why he picked Tilly to go with him. Yep. Yep. And um, one of the interesting things that uh, I notice here when they leave the ship. Yep. There are these like chunks of rock that are suspended in the air around it. And if any of our listeners or viewers are Magic the Gathering players, felt very much like this one set that came out back in 2010 called Zendikar, okay. where the, the plane uh, was very lush and fertile, had all the different seasons and stuff like that. But there were floating rock formations and these floating obelisks in the area. Oh, really? As an avid okay. player, I was like, "Oh, that's cool." But also, if you've seen, if you've seen uh, Jim Cameron's Avatar, mm-hmm. uh, it's very much like that. Where you've got like the floating areas of rock with all the plants, you know, there for the, yep. where They go and get their little dragonflyers. It's pretty cool. <laughs> yes, you're right. I, I, I do remember that, and that was uh, that was a nice visual that you don't see a whole lot of just something that was a little little extra uh, eye candy to to be able to look at yeah. and um so they they're heading towards one of the one of the settlements that they that they heard of um preparing for that that first contact scenario um and have a and have a nice discussion on the on the way during this during this walk and that's that's another one of the one of the things that I I like about the show so, so far from what I've seen is that it can take time it can slow down and take some time to do some character development it's not just boom 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 going at at 100 miles an hour we we saw that in the first episode with uh, with Michael Burnham and and Cleveland Book that there were there were those interaction moments uh, in between in between the action we get that here as well 
um, so that we we take a, we take those pauses from the the breakneck going at it 100 miles an hour action into let's get in some some character development time. Absolutely, and it was a nice slow moment that was like. You know, as the audience member, I was like bordering on my what's going to happen, what's going to happen, what's going to happen moment. Mm -hmm. um, shortly before they leave Discovery, uh, Giorgio and Nan are in the turbo lift on Discovery and the deck opens and there's Linus, our resident Saurian. And Giorgio is like, you must be able to see everything. And he's like, oh, yeah, so many different spectrums. And she's like, come with me. And she takes him away. And I don't think we got closure on that. No, we did not get closure on that. Uh, she it just she seemed to be uh, very interest, interested in him. Um, I uh, she she had her her arm linked in in his and walked away to the turbo lift and I'm thinking, uh, I mean, the, the implication that I took from that is she's taking him for a quickie. Yeah, See, I, I went, I went just slightly more morbid than you did equally bad, but I was like, she's going to eat him. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, our story. I mean, she eats Kelpie and Gill is sorry. And yeah. I also a delicacy, right? Maybe she was hungry. <laughs> I don't know. But, you know I, really hope, I hope we're not going there. <laughs> was my my next thought was is maybe she used him to scout the area that uh, that they that, that Saru and Tilly were going, so mm -hmm. she could be backup security in that area. Also, okay, uh, that would work conceivably we didn't see it happen maybe it got edited out whatever right. but um that would be um we have two really bad options and one kind of okay one and i want to <laughs> lean towards that right right what do you well, think the, about no go ahead i, I was just gonna say real quick um i'm i'm glad that we got some more some more time with that character and hopefully we'll we'll get him a little more i do like linus yeah, Linus is good people. Yeah, yeah. What uh, what did you make of that parasitic ice that Discovery was resting in? Oh, now that that is new. That is new. That's definitely different. And that is one of the things when I was thinking this before the season, and I'm sure all of us were were thinking that is just what what is 900 plus years in the future going to look like what are we going to see that uh that convinces us convinces us that it's that far but yet even have a chance of still being somewhat relatable because there is that problem of you you get so far into the into the future with your your characters your technology that you just you, you can't, you can't relate to them. You know, every, everything's magic. Every, everything's just so super advanced and, and, and whatnot. You could flick your fingers and, you know, replicate something in front of you. Um, but seeing this, it, it's, it's an alien planet. Uh, well, we don't know what planet it is yet. Uh, you know, we, we get told it never really had an official name, which uh, is in the scene we'll talk about in a little bit here. But I like the parasitic ice. That that was a very interesting uh, layer of, of the sense of urgency that they have to get the ship fixed and and get out of there. Because I mean, who 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 would have thought? Wrap your head around parasitic ice. Like, how does that work? Yeah, you know. So yes, yes, I was, and then that's not so much a a future thing. That that's just a. This is a this is a uh, a planet that has a feature that is unique to this planet, which we don't get that a whole lot. I I, I can't recall many other instances where uh, the the planet itself or some part of it or the, or the terrain was shown as uh, as being a hazard like this in in Trek. 
it, it was almost like there's a there's a natural feature on Earth called kudzu, which is like super quick growing vines that will wrap around and you know if you get stuck in it you're you're done kind of sort of really uh yeah wow and i never it, i'm gonna uh, have to look that, i, never I mean it's that. it's not like they they actively move and wrap around you or anything like that it's just as really thick dense foliage okay. that if you get stuck in it you're pretty mangled oh. uh, you know you can cut your way through it if you have a machete but discovery didn't have the right machete to get out of parasitic ice nope they didn't i I was trying to think of it from like a life perspective, like what kind of organism would be able to adapt to the freezing temperatures of ice, but also use ice as, you know, a means to gain, to gather nutrition and minerals like Discovery's big iron ship. Oh, that's probably really tasty. And there are, uh, you know, um, you know, cellular life forms that do kind of feed on, those kinds of residues and of course anything science fiction can cook up that feeds on the power signatures of anything mm -hmm. so you know maybe it was just some kind of super cool heretofore unseen life form that was able to uh you know manipulate the ice to capture food yes either in its web Oh yeah, I, I like that. Well, of, of course, it's going to be a <clears throat> analogy to a spider and its web. <clears throat> Excuse me, because the episode is uh, a riff off of Spider-Man movie with the episode Dude, title "Far From Home." You just made the connection. Mind blown. <laughs> Sometimes I can do that. <laughs> it's, it's beautiful. Um, there was a moment where there was a nice line said by uh, Giorgio before they left the ship. Uh, where Giorgio was like, "Bureaucracy is where fun goes to die." Yes, oh, I love that line. Yeah, that's kind of true. But I, you saying it is what scares me. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone who worked works in an office hears that line, and it just kind of gives them the chills. Oh, that's right. Chills, Ice Planet. Jay, you're two for two. I'm a. Hey, I'm on it. You know, it's, you got this. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That is all yeah. for the night. <laughs> he'll be no. He'll be here all night. Right. <laughs> Unless we do this in one take. Um, <laughs> okay. So uh, Saru and Tilly have left. They get yep. the character moment. They come across this mining station. They recognize that all of the mining equipment looks like it's been shot up. There's a really cool moment where you see like. This giant earth mover in the background. Those are in use today on Earth. They have these giant, like 30 story massive machines with 10 story blades that just cut into the sides of mountains. They're uh, phenomenal to, to see in pictures. I have wow. no idea what I'd feel like if I saw one in real life. I think like aliens are terraforming Earth or something. Right. Yeah, think about that. We we have the technology to start terraforming mountains because we have these giant pieces of machinery yeah. and they they have they have them there as as well. Yeah. Um and so they get to the station, they're following somebody. Uh and they follow him around the corner into this cavern. We get to see that when the person walks around the cavern, he disappears. Did he is it a holographic you know, cloak thing? Did he walk through some kind of cloaking field? Mm -hmm. Did a transporter? Was he holographic himself and it's just out of range? And they turn the corner, Saru and Tilly, and walk forward and also end up teleporting right to the, the front of uh, the last Western saloon in the universe. Uh, right. <laughs> and, and you're right. But that's, that's the thing that I... So who, who was that guy? We we did I, we never saw the guy. I, what was the I whole? I think I think he was Cal. Okay, you think that was Cal? I think okay. that was Cal. I think that was Cal, and he was sort of leading them there, in okay. sort of like a, a, I need I I if you're cool, you're gonna be among friends, but if you're not cool, we're gonna kill you. It's keeping my distance from you, don't know who mm -hmm. you are, but if you stay out here in the cold, you're gonna die. <clears throat> okay. So there's this very sort of game of of you know stay stay ahead but yes. keep you in sight so okay. he lures them to the saloon, to the saloon. i'm just going to call it a saloon because it's totally equipped with the the doors that swing open like every oh, classic yeah. western and oh, yeah we're uh, not kidding here it, it's the saloon doors <laughs> yeah and so they're um you know they walk in they don't really know anything and these guys pull their guns out and 
um, you know, they, they have a conversation and because Saru and Tilly have no idea what to fake and what not to fake here, Mm -hmm. um, they totally blow their covers. Um, they don't, nobody guesses that they've time traveled yet, but they're like, yeah, you guys really are Starfleet. Cause Tilly's like, look, here's the, the code, the Starfleet code. And please put your guns down. Cause they're really scary. Right. She, she quotes one of the, one of the regulations. And th- this was, this was a very good decision here with having this scene. So we're, we're 930 years in the future. And what happens in episode two? We have a saloon walk-in with the, you know, the, the, the two people from out of town walking into the, walking into the saloon with the, you know, other cowboys sitting there looking at them funny and drawing guns. And it, it made you, it made you forget that, well, this could be, this could be the, you know, the, the 1880s walking in uh, and especially when uh, uh, when the bad guy comes in, which I don't want to jump ahead just yet, but you know what I'm talking about. He totally uh, uh, accentuates the, uh, uh, the 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 Western showdown feel of it. Absolutely. Um, I was thinking about it, and I was like, you know, the the standard Western saloon is is very much indicative of like this is what. This is what saloons look like mm-hmm. in, in on the frontier. Oh yes, right. And and if you're on a, I mean, it's not like it's not like drinking drinking holes are going to change a whole lot in frontier towns. Whether you're on one planet or you're on the frontier of a galactic organization, right? And uh, you know, we learn that the guy who lured them there, I'm assuming, was Cal, and that they are Corridonites. They're from Corridon. Corridon is listed as one of the founding members of the Federation. That's yes, yes. When and I when I heard Corridons, yes, I now I I'm I, okay. Let, while I'm thinking, you you go ahead. You go ahead. I got I got something to come back around to later on that. Well, and uh, you know the Corridonite ambassador was present on Earth in 2155 uh, during um, you know journey to uh, sorry shadows of Pajem. Uh, okay. Yep. So, so they 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 were in Enterprise, uh, and they were mentioned in you know Journey to Babel and Discovery, Magic to Make the Sanest Man Go Mad. Mm-hmm. Uh, but here we learn that there is a mining group of Cordonites out here mining all kinds of cool stuff, and that's the whole purpose why Saru and Tilly are here in the first place. They need rubidonite for their to to fix their communications equipment oh, right right so they've they've got to get in there to get a source for repairs and i i do like that we are getting a little bit of development from one of the other lesser known uh, founding fathers of the federation um and it's it's not just the big four with the humans vulcans and dorians and tellarites Right. Um, so that's <clears throat> glad they're, they're expanding that, uh, and they've, they've got to negotiate for, for parts. It's kind of like from, uh, the, the phantom menace, we've got a part of our ship that's broke and we've got to go to the locals and try to try to barter to get it fixed. Um, uh, so, so yeah. And then they, they're the, the guy, Cal, had been trying to trying to convince his, uh, his, his friends. I got the vibe that the one guy, the bartender was his brother. I'm not, I don't know why I, I thought that or got that vibe, but it, it, it seemed like there was, or it were maybe just, you know, friends. Um, but yeah, he, he still believed in the, in the Federation that they were, they were Starfleet. Um, and they start dropping some of those conversational cues about what's what's been happening and Saru and Tilly being fish out of water is they've they've got a lot uh, catching up to do and and to them of course naturally it it feels strange that there's no there's no federation there's no 
Starfleet. Okay, we've got yeah. to put that over here on the back burner, but what the hell's going on? Uh, which is the same reaction that, that Michael had in the previous episode. Yeah. No, Saru did a really good job of invoking what, from his perspective, would be called the Temporal Prime Directive <clears throat> yes. uh, before they left the ship. And he was like, you know, it doesn't matter where or when we are, we know things about a certain place and time that we cannot, you know, uh, divulge uh, to avoid influencing things here and now. Mm-hmm. Um, not like a 930 year old historian is going to care. <laughs> right. <laughs> no one's going to care about that. Um, but we flash back to the ship and Stamets has just been cleared by Colbert because he can finally spell uh, all the things that he needs to say. To Colbert. <laughs> <laughs> what did he have him spell? Uh, like, uh, I, like, I, I uh, went into the future and all I got with this crummy shirt. I think it was like, you know, um, I was put into a enforced coma, woke up 930 years in the future, and all I got was this lousy t-shirt. And yes, yeah. Culver yeah. made him spell all of it. And the first time, he's just like, ah. And so he had to go through the medical treatment. And now he's like coming out of it, and the it, it, it scene opens with him going, S-H-I-R-T. And Culver's like, uh-uh, t-shirt has a hyphen in it, you moron. Right. Ah, oh, <laughs> son of a bitch. <laughs> um. But uh, there was, you know, there was another moment there where, you know, Stamets gets released and he's going to go try and fix the ship with what they have. And mm-hmm. he, he partners up with, um, with Jet. And Jet, again, is just being her standard acerbic self. And um, it's really interesting because, it, you know, she's saying things to Stamets about, you know, how he's going to get through this. And it really reminded me again of that pod directive episode because she talks about how, you know, she goes to therapy and she is, she, she encourages people to go to therapy because Mm -hmm. she thinks it's awesome. And uh, I just thought that was really cool that like jet has a little bit of TIG in her in that respect and maybe more, right. Uh, You know, TIG is a comedian by trade. So having somebody who just has that acerbic wit on board might just be, you know, Tig's uh, self person. Um, right. She could be playing herself for all we know. <laughs> right. But uh, Stamick, Stamets, um, he ignores all the medical stuff and he goes up into that Jeffrey's tube anyway. Well, there's, there's a job that needs to, to get done and, and he's going to do it. Now, I'm trying to remember, like they said the word dresh, but I don't remember what that meant. Uh, yeah, the, the word, the word uh, the dresh, the dresh got, got thrown out there a couple times. And uh, okay, so I know what the vidresh are. Right. I, I think that the speculation is, well, no, I think this was, this was old speculation was that that was, that was the name that ended up, um, becoming what was what was the federation like through through the years through the centuries something about the 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 name started kind of getting watered down it's it's like when you tell someone a story and then you have that person tell it to the guy on the right and then on down and down and down and down and down by the time you get to the end it's a completely different like okay, the, the parrot fell off the mountain drinking a can of beer, pass the word. And it was nothing like how it, how it started. However, now that we're, now that we're into the uh, end of the season, that, that sounds like that, that that's not the, the connection because the word Starfleet and the word Federation is still, is still used. It's, it's not like Federation somehow devolved into going from Federation to the the Dresch, um especially since the um the burn only happened about 120 some years ago a, a, a word is not going to change connotation that much in 100 years i don't well, I'm think look, i'm looking at memory alpha mm-hmm. and memory alpha says the Vidresh is a 32nd century or a 33rd century concept Okay. Uh, if you saw the short track Calypso, yes, where that guy comes on board 
discovery and discoveries alone in space. Um, the the pod that he came aboard is a Vadresh escape pod. Mm-hmm. And so it, it is kind of cool, you know, to get that reference again there. I was like, I know what this was. And I have a little note here in my notes. Look it up before the podcast. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> right. Well, and I, I think that's, they're going to play into, I, uh, I believe that's going to be probably a race that is introduced as one of the, the big power players now in the 32nd century. Could be. That that's Very that's just so. where I where I think they're going with that. That would that would be really cool, um, and it would give a bit more insight into that short trek. <clears throat> it, it it would. Well, yeah, because uh, right now that that sh- that short trek had always been kind of kind of the outlier. Like it it didn't it didn't tie into anything else really, and and, and nothing fed off of it really until these couple mentions. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that now it seems like that, that one, because in, in that short trek, was that, was that another thousand years from now? Because I, I know it was, it was oh, it's further. Just a, it's just a hundred years. I know it was further it's into the years. future because whatever happened that's left voyage or voyager uh left discovery alone and abandoned like that has to be something that's going to happen somewhere further down the line uh yeah. because the, the short tracks are canon so not that they have to immediately have some kind of tie-in even even by series end but they, they, yeah. there is an acknowledgement that at some point in the future this ship is is left in space. Well, we learn at the end of this episode that it's 3189, which is the 32nd century. So the yes. 33rd century is just 11 years away. Okay, right, right. Yep, not not too far. Not too far, but but far enough for us to go, okay, so when is Discovery going to be abandoned? All those other things. Okay, yep. So that's uh, that'll be something to look forward to. Um. After our scene with Stamets and Jet, we go back to the Western mm-hmm. Saloon. <laughs> we we learned that the name of the place, nobody ever really gave it a name that's called the Colony. Mm-hmm. And there's this dude named Zara who is a courier, but he basically screwed up all of their stuff to make everybody there dependent on his deliveries. Right. So he basically gets away with whatever he wants. He's kind of an asshole. And, uh, you know, he's about to show up because, of course, our heroes have, are nothing if not timely. Mm-hmm. They're trying to push uh, Saru and Tilly out the door, and then they show up, and they are decked out in boots with stirrups and, and, and that kills spurs. Me. It is the wild, wild west. Um, Nathan Fillion himself could have been here, and I'd be like, oh, Firefly. We're in Firefly now. God. <laughs> um, and I would have been okay with it. Yeah, I know. I'd be like, all right, Discovery just got good. We're good. Let, yep, let's do this. Um, <laughs> but the, the guy coming in, hearing hearing this, the, um, what, what are the things on the boots? Uh, the uh, Spurs. Yeah, the spurs. Hearing those spurs clanking, walking in. I said, really? This is this is great. I mean, what better way to to seal the, the atmosphere of the thing than to have the bad guy walk in all dressed in black with his the spurs clanking as he's walking it's you know the the, the only thing they didn't have was was the the whistle the right <laughs> i can't yeah, really no, whistle that was, well so it was it was fundamentally ridiculous <sighs> um but yeah uh before they walk in Tilly is watching Cal rebuild the tech that she has with programmable matter. And she's like, what is yeah, that? The, the little wands, the programmable yeah, matter and, wands. And, and so like programmable matter is so ubiquitous that it's just like, yeah, this is what it is. And Tilly's just totally stunned by it, which I think is really cool uh, that we have programmable matter now. Right, right. Well, the, the reaction she had would be the, the same. Uh, imagine if somebody from from the 11th century here uh, you know here on earth 
somehow found themselves in in 2020 looking at a looking at a cell phone i mean everything around them would be like how how do you even wrap your head around seeing things like that uh, and so and that was a thing is even coming from an environment where you're on you're on ships that travel faster than the speed of light you've got all this technology and everything else that you're able to go into the future and see something that still gives you that wow factor that wow you have you have this this is like the most amazing thing that we did not have back in our time whereas this guy is like yeah you can buy these at walmart right <laughs> Yeah. So, um, this dude Zara comes in and he's here because he detected discovery enter and crash. Mm -hmm. And he like, he says that they have no sense of what the ship is in their database. And their friend Cal is like, Hey, you better back off. They've got more friends and Federation ships. And Zara is like, not even deterred. And he goes and he's like, you know, we detected high energy gamma rays and gravitational waves. Yes. Um, and uh, he just is like, you guys are time travelers, which scares the Corridonites in the bar because time travel is illegal now. Yep. Yep. Yeah, they were definitely uh, bothered and worried by that. Yeah. And that had me that had me wondering that, OK, who who is this guy that he's that he knows all these things? And I'm not I'm not saying that he that you have to be someone special to be smart. You can be a, you can be a bad guy and be well-informed and have, you know, all this technology. I mean, it, it is the 32nd century after all, but it, it, it's, it seemed like he was privy to, to more technical things than you would think somebody who was um, just this jabroni courier that was, that was bullying people. Well, there are a lot of fictions that take place in post-apocalypse moments like this mm -hmm. where you find out that one of the main villains was actually either part of or related to somebody who was part of the previous government. Where you, you end up with someone who's like, yeah, my daddy was high up and he taught me how to do what I do. And well, what I do ain't very nice, but I'm the mm -hmm. best one at it. And uh, I kind right. of was like, what if Zara is like, former federation or his dad was former starfleet and right now you really are in a doggy -eat dog world we didn't ever get to see zara's ship we don't know what it looks like for very well it could just be a patched up your relativity mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. definitely something to you know it was also kind of a cliffhanger there towards the end right um well you're looking at a kind of collapse of civilization sort of thing almost like in in the walking dead where it's it, it turns into every man for himself kind of thing and the the people that come from some kind of uh background of of authority or uh enforcement or military background are going to be the ones that will probably survive longer than say the guy that was a, that was a pencil pusher working in an office, you know, he's, he's dead meat. Uh, so yes, th this guy seems like he's, he's come from something either, either directly himself, or as you said, may have had uh, ancestors that were, that were in Starfleet. Well, and he just, he knows a lot. He knows, yeah. he knows right away that they don't belong there, suspects time travel right away because time travel's outlawed. Um, it's, it's definitely, he, he knows more than he's letting on. Whether we get to see him again is another story. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're not dealing with Mad Dog Buford Tannen. Right. You know, the, the Buford <laughs> Mad Dog Tannen. We're, we're dealing with someone who's pretty smart. So this dude walks in and quickly takes control of the situation, kills mm -hmm. Cal for helping Saru and Tilly, really like extendedly, painfully kills oh, that guy. Yeah. Um, 
and uh, Zara starts taking all their stuff, and he's like, we're going to break this down for materials. Um, Saru objects, but Zara, Zara is like, you've got no authority here, and oh, by the way, that ice is going to crush your ship, so you don't have a whole lot of time to like deal with me. Right, right, and, and putting in that, that sense of urgency that um, this guy knows what he wants, and he's certainly well-practiced in doing what he needs to do and knowing what he needs to, to say to get that. Um, and especially those rare times where he's dealing with someone, someone who's bullheaded like, like Saru. I, I mean, th this guy is not backing down. Saru is one of those, he, he will get in your face and just tell you, no, I'm not taking you to the ship, you know, excuse me. And that, that's, that's what I really like about this guy and just what what has that 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 leadership quality that just comes out is is that you're not going to easily face this guy he he's he's not putting up with anybody's shit yeah definitely uh we roll back to discovery stamets is in the jeffrey's tube he's trying to fix it uh nan discovers that Giorgio did not join them on the decade for repairs with uh with mm -hmm. lioness and a sudden jolt to the ship leaves stamets bleeding in the jeffrey's tube the, the the task incomplete for the moment we head back to the saloon where saru and zara are negotiating a deal and zara prepares to send tilly back to the ship to retrieve the dilithium. He warns her that at night the ice infests everything, it's really scary, whatever, but before she can leave, Zara's men show up with Giorgio. She has been scouting a security. Everybody's making fun of that because it's like, hey, we found one person, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> and, oh, uh, you found the wrong person. <laughs> I know, like everybody in the audience is like, yeah, she's gonna kill everybody, it's over. Yeah, I've, um, I've got a mirror universe ass kicking with your name on it. Right. It's coming right and, up. <laughs> uh, Zara orders Giorgio shot, uh, but Giorgio deduces, deduces that Zara's competitors likely also observed Discovery's arrival and are on their way, and Zara is not strong enough to fend all of those guys off. Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of hesitation causes Zara to shoot her on a low power setting with his crazy plasma shotgun. Uh, shoots her several times, uh, and then Giorgio gets the best of him. <laughs> she's like, she's like, pain is foreplay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, Giorgio and Saru taking on these dudes at the saloon. Well, and when so when Giorgio came in, they they threw her in. That was just an, an immediate like, oh, you, yeah. you guys, yeah, you're so screwed. You're so screwed. <laughs> you're, you're screwed, and you don't even know it yet. And, and know, yeah, right? this this guy. And here here's the other thing that that I thought is that okay, if I'm what was the guy's name again? Zara. 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 If if I'm him and I've shot this lady a couple times with my with my pain gun, and she gets up from it, chuckles it off, and you know she, she says, "Where I'm from, this is foreplay." At that point, I'm thinking, hmm, I maybe don't want to proceed down this path because <laughs> that has me. You know, you would you would take pause for a moment, like, okay, what have I got myself into here? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm pretty sure by the time she said that, they had already subdued his people. She had told that one guy with the red eyes, like, he's going to get you killed. And by the end of the fight, his neck is broken. And he's lying on the floor, dead. Yes. <laughs> um, it's just, you know, Giorgio, the character of Empress Giorgio commands every frame that she's in. Absolutely. And and not only does she command it, but she has zero regard for anybody in the room other than what they can do for her. Yes. And she allies with Starfleet because she knows they'll live up to their word. Mm -hmm. So the enemy you know is better than the enemy you don't. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. From the second she walked into that room, it was like, ah, the urgency is no longer here. Giorgio is going to kill everybody. It's over. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then we have a, a good old fashioned bar fight. We do. 
that and, uh, <laughs> it, well, it couldn't it couldn't have gone any other direction than being a a, a bar fight in a western. That's that's yeah. what this was. You know, when Georgia was getting shot, though, I was like, in their in their universe, they have these agonizers, so she yes. had to totally be used to that kind of shit. It, it you know, yeah. and that would definitely be something I would expect a leader in that universe to expose themselves to repeatedly. It's like iocane powder; you do it enough, you get an immunity. Uh, you know, so you're she's she's developed this extraordinarily high pain princess pressure. bride reference for anyone who missed it <laughs> and she's she's also sort of like and and giorgio is kind of that that she would twist it this way she would twist right. that kind of pain to be pleasure to be motivating and inspiring instead of like withdraw from the pain right so that's just totally cool with her character well are we I know at one point, correct me if I'm wrong, but I do believe at one point, uh, and we may still be doing this, but don't we train CIA, FBI, military? Isn't there waterboarding training that some organization has has put through to to basically, if you're you're captured and tortured, this is what to expect? And and like, you're right, you build up some tolerance to... Uh, to being under duress, isn't that isn't that still a thing? If the CIA knock on your door, I don't know you. <laughs> oh, <Uh-oh>, don't! <laughs> wouldn't that be the <laughs> wouldn't that be the podcast of the year if suddenly no, I just you, get a, a potato sack put over my head? I you know, know, horrible. You know, punch in the kidney and <laughs> I get dragged off screen. <laughs> um, you're you're not wrong. It's, it definitely behooves any organization involved in clandestine operations, yes. or just generic military operations, to make sure that the troops that they field are aware of what they might endure and maybe have endured endured something like it already to give them a tolerance Mm -hmm. to train them in the middle of your pain you still have a job to do where you know you and i we could get a graze on our shoulder and totally go down because we've never been shot before somebody else might get a graze or full-on shot but they've had the training and the experience that says don't give in just because of that you still have a job to do right right like this this is where the the human body and mind can get to with, with training. So right. if they come at you with the, with, with the tweezers and the first thing they're going to do is, is pluck your nose hair. That's nothing. Don't pan, don't start giving up stuff there. But once they get to this or that, then, okay, you're going to just have to take it to your grave because now you're screwed. So it's, it's like have, have something that, that gets you mentally prepared so that you're not breaking down on what what could it's still going to hurt but it's like you know you're you can last up to here but then here are the here are the steps that when you you see her in this you know that you're not at that breaking point so that you're not you're not squealing down down to here so i i think you're right that there's there's certainly for for someone in that position of power in the mirror universe that 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 could be uh knowing knowing empress georgia uh, using the agonizer on herself is probably a kink Tuh. it's gotta well, be it's, please tell me i'm wrong but she just she seems like that's exactly the kind of thing <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. Right, right, um, right, right, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, no, you don't make Empress of the Terran Empire without being able to take, you know, a lot of pain. Because mm-hmm. you vote, you vote, you, you've mutinied against the people who were in command above you. And, you know, in doing so, you probably got agonized a few times. And if you didn't twist that into something that was more motivating, Mm-hmm. Um, you know, obviously, Georgio is super ambitious. She even says at the beginning of the episode, "I like jumping to, I like jumping universes, or something like that." Right. Um, right. So, yeah, I think she is right in her element, uh, where she feels like she could build a completely new empire. And I think she says it again in the saloon scene. She's like, mm-hmm. "I did this. I did this, not even thinking about it. Imagine what I could do in my sleep." Yes. Right. <laughs> 
Right. So very formidable. And she just completely turns the tide um, of the, of the whole room. And uh, that, that now we get to your, your favorite part you liked with, uh, with oh. Saru is he's, he's got ranged weapons. <laughs> he just, he's got these like skinned air missiles that just whip around his ears. <laughs> and he, he fires them on Zara and Zara just gets stabbed like eight times, four in the arm and four in the leg. And these are not, you know, they, they, I thought they were small when they whipped around his head, but if you see Zara, he's got like oh. these three inch spines sticking yeah, this, out of his arm. This quills so hurt. Like that, that looks real painful. Um, and, and the you know, other and, thing that we, then, yeah, go, go ahead, go ahead. I was just saying until he knocks him over the head with uh, a glass bottle while uh, Saru and George O are arguing about whether to shoot him or not. <laughs> right. It's just such a, it's such a Western moment. Now, had we had we ever seen the the the, uh, the show of physical strength of of Saru? Because he he grabbed that guy's oh the yeah, guy's that guy's forearm and just just, just crack you know yeah. with the with the turn of turn of the arm. Uh, so he's certainly very physically strong. Very strong. Um, I don't remember ever seeing him display that kind of physical prowess prowess now i know he can run like a gazelle uh, as we saw him well he's got season one where he got two he's what he's got those badass boots too oh, right right those, those running boots <laughs> right right um so that was that was great and he did this did it so calm and casual like uh you know here forearm broken flaps right and i don't remember what it was called but like after he as a kelpian overcame whatever that biological threshold was right he went from prey to predator yes and so he's keeping these things in a really cool balance but when he needs to throw down he throws down Oh, hard. yes, he does. Yes, he does. And that was just, it was really cool to see Saru be able to do that and step up and, and really live up to the words that he was espousing as a captain, as somebody who will enforce the um, the goals of the Federation, even in this time. Right. And that, that was a nice, uh, a nice feature that I really liked of, of his attack is that's just another layer. Another thing that we don't see is... An, an alien species using something that is part of their physiology in self-defense. Now with, with the Vulcans, we would always see the, um, uh, the, the Vulcan nerve pinch, but not, not, you know, we, we didn't, we haven't seen a lot of other races um, have the, have a unique ability that's, that's just known to their physiology in a, in a combat in a combat situation like that besides bes- right right you know besides just being strong right um so no it was a really cool moment uh, mm-hmm. for saru to have that kind of uh, uh, ability um yeah so that fight goes down um Tilly notes that the sun has set, which means the parasitic ice is going to try to eat Discovery. Flash back to Discovery, where Reno's watching, or Jet's watching uh, Stamets via remote tricorder repair the relay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he had and, that, that, that little bot that right. was like staying just, just in front of him following. And uh, Colbert arrives and chastises Stamets again, but Reno tells him to set aside his anger so he can repair the relay. It's like, this isn't going to do anything for him, so knock it off. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I was just like, Jet, dear God, Jet, I love you. Um, and I wrote also, like, damn it, Stamets. I hate it when ill, wounded, and crew try to live above th- those wounds to do something heroic. But yeah. it, I guess if I think about it, it, it can make sense if you think of the people who joined Starfleet as the ones who put their own health on a lower plate than exploring and fixing and doing. Right. Um, so that's where it makes sense. I don't like it, but that's where it makes sense. Um, <laughs> I, I, I agree with you. You're right. It, 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 it does. There, there are many times where in, in Starfleet, you have to put your, your health and well-being in, in peril um, because you've got to 
save the ship or save the crew, whatever it may be. And, uh, you know, if you, if you've got an injury, if it's not life threatening, but you're the only one who can do the thing, then you got to do the thing, even if it's <clears throat> at a, a very high level of discomfort. Absolutely. Um, Stamets is able to fix it and Jet is like, way to go, Bobcat. <laughs> Cobra's like, Cobra's like, Bobcat? And Jet's like, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm on drugs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, that's why, that's why Jet is all of us because <laughs> she, 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 she tells it living, like it is. She's living in this future, but she absolutely uses the words that are totally relevant to everything we do in life. Yes. Uh, today in this, in this year. I'm, I'm uh, telling you this, this character is going to, to score big th this season. She is going to yeah. be a character that's, that's up there for who's, who's your favorite character of season three of discovery. And it's, I'm sure it's going to be jet Reno is going to be in the top three. Yeah, no, Tig and Tig and Saru. I'm like, I'm living for discovery for these two characters. And if yeah. you, if you, Jay, if you haven't listened to it, and and dear viewer, dear listener, if mm -hmm. you haven't listened to it, um, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna rep not us, but the Pod Directive does some really cool stuff, and that episode okay. of Tig is really really good. Okay, nice. That's um, out. again, flashback to the saloon. Everyone's trying to figure out what to do with this guy because we're not going to kill him. And Saru's like, you know what? Let's just get leave all the people here with all his stuff and he can go out into the cold. And he's like, I won't make it. And the Cordonite is like, well, you know, Tilly, give him your pack. And then... It, yeah, you're going to have yeah. her do it. Yeah, exactly. You were going to have her do it. So we're just going to have you do it. And one of the one of the weaknesses there that I saw was like, okay, so you promised to give the Cordonites his ship, but you didn't secure said ship before you let him walk out the door. And I thought that was like a really big oversight. <laughs> like he's just going to transport back to his ship and all hell's going to break loose. I'm just surprised they let the guy walk. That Well, Saru put it in the, the hands of the the bartender i'm surprised that guy let him walk after after well whether it was his brother and yeah you know, i don't don't know if uh if they're brothers i just some i got that vibe um so whether they were brothers or, or friends or whatever um i that's that's the part that kind of like why is that guy walking out there then I just, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I'm sure he's probably needed for the plot in a forthcoming episode, possibly. I don't know. But I just, that, that kind of surprised me was that that dude wasn't going out feet first on a, on a stretcher. So that's, that's all I got to say about that. Um, it was really weird. But mm -hmm. uh, Saru... Uh, Saru promises to give the miners all the dilithium they need to power their vessels. Um, they let Zara go. Uh, Giorgio promises to kill Zara if he ever comes back. He says he's gonna, she's gonna rip his throat out. Mm -hmm. And after Zara leaves, uh, Osir gives Saru a personal transporter and welcomes him to the future. Where was he? Where where was this stashed? Where is he hiding this thing? And are, are they are they that common? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, are they that common? It's just like okay, here, you know, this we carry these in this time in our in our pockets. We've all got them. Well, in Nemesis, we had the prototype personal transporters, mm -hmm. and that was eight hundred years ago. Yep. So I'm totally on board with a prototype technology becoming ubiquitous. Everybody has one of these tech. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. By by the thirty, you know, by nine hundred years. I mean, think about it. One hundred and twenty years ago it was nineteen hundred. Personal conveyances were just being invented. Everybody said they were never gonna, never gonna replace a horse. Horses are way too reliable. And here we are in twenty twenty. There's thousands of different models of car, millions mm -hmm. of them on the road. They're and driving horses, themselves now. They're driving themselves now, and horses are a luxury relegated to the, the either really dependent or very wealthy. 
Right. And so that was right. only 120 years to make a car ubiquitous hmm. and all of the moving parts in it and all of the industry surrounding it. I, I have no doubt that um, in, in 800 years post nemesis that a personal transporter would be everyday technology. It, it'd be like how we're carrying around a flash drive right now. Right. I mean, put, put a flash drive in your hand, take that back to, take it back to the sixties or, you know, the 60s, 70s, 80s, all the way up to even the 90s. And it's like, that's ridiculous that you could be holding in your hand a device with, with that much storage. Right. I, I mean, the, the, the amount of file size that the, uh, the, you know, your mouse takes and drivers when you plug it into the computer was more than the storage space used to send a shuttle to the moon or, or something, something I crazy mean, like that. If you even really want to think about it, personal technology, 25 years ago, cell phones were like on Saved by the Bell with Zach Morris and the giant yeah. brick. Oh. And <laughs> I remember, I remember in 98, 99, I wanted to get a cell phone. And by golly, the plan was, it was only $50 a month for 200 minutes, mom. <laughs> And you had to and talk I, at the, night. If, if you're free. listening to this, I, if you're listening to this or watching this, and I know I'm dating myself, but mm -hmm. like that was the way it was in the late '90s. You actually played for a section. You, you paid for a series of minutes: two hundred, yep. four hundred, six hundred. Unlimited plans were weren't even a thing until like 2005, 2006, and you mm -hmm. paid through the nose for them. Right. And it wasn't really until the iPhone came out that the game started being like, yeah, we don't care how many minutes you use. It's all about data now. We want text messages. We want your, your, your data, uh, your SMS data, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, all of those things, you know, and Wi-Fi started being a thing on phones. You started being able to connect to the internet. Um, after, you know, with the with the with the advent of the iPhone, you couldn't do that before. Really, you could send text messages and you could send um, SMS, but you needed um, you needed one of those pocket pads. I forget what they're called, but you need one. Uh, of yeah, those. A hotspot, <clears throat> uh, air pad. A, or, um, it's a specific device. I can't remember what it's called. I, 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 yeah, I know what you're talking about. I can't um, recall what name exactly was. A was palm. Good. You needed a Palm Pilot. That's oh. what they were called. You needed a Palm Pilot to do advanced stuff on cell phones until like 2007. Oh my God, Palm out. Pilot. Right, you haven't thought about that since they were popular. <laughs> um, you know, and Blackberries and all those things. I, I knew you were going to say then. Blackberry. I was just thinking, but, oh my God, he's going to say Blackberries. But Jesus. again, <laughs> if, if, you are, if you are 23 or around 23 years of age, this is what we had to grow up with when you were born. And if yes. you're older than 23 and were conscious in 1997, like not two or three or four years old, but if you were like maybe a teenager in 1997, mm -hmm. you understand, you get it. You're bobbing your head along and we appreciate you. We appreciate all of you. But, um, you know, there are going to be those of you who are going to listen to this podcast and you're going to be like, man, you're talking about the dark ages. And I'm like, hey, at least we had color. Okay. We had do, color do in the world color tea because the color came in in like 1950s before that everything was black and white do you know i've, I've got to i've got to tell you this and this is swear to god this happened this was maybe around 2013 2014 uh so i'm driving around in the, in the car with with nacho you know nacho my son nacho has been on yeah. some of our some of our podcasts and we were just talking about stuff in the 80s i mean i I was born in the late, uh, you know, mid to late seventies, grew up in the eighties. And it's just, that time is just like a whole other world for, for these kids. So we're talking about all this, this old stuff from the, the back in the, the dark ages in the, in the eighties and nineties, um, asking about computers and, and video games and like, uh, well, did you do this or did you have the internet and all that? And I was just telling them, I was like, no, no, you know, the, the internet was, was new. It was like, not until I was in high school that really started becoming a thing in the home and all this other stuff. And then, uh, he asked, was Netflix and black and white? I swear. That's the end of the show. Everybody we're done. Yes. Here. I was, I was done. Wow. I al almost flipped the vehicle off oh. the road was Netflix and black and white is, it's just because it's just unfathomable. For those of you, for those of you that are listening, we're going to go a little more off road here. We went from the kind of the, the whole this conversation started because we're like personal transporters. Can you have those? And it's like, well, it's only been 20 years since cell phones were really commercial. So, yeah, you probably could have them. Yeah. But, 
but I'm going to take it a little bit further. You had Nacho do that to you, Netflix and black and white. Mm-hmm. Um, my goddaughter, bless her heart. She was born in 2010. Mm-hmm. She just, she just hit double digits this year. Wow. When she was like four or five, she came over to the house and she wanted to watch something on Netflix or Hulu or whatever. And at the parents' house, they had their video game system hooked up to uh, verbal commands so that she could just walk up to the TV and tell the TV what she wanted to see. And she'd be like, Xbox, Netflix, or Xbox, mm-hmm. or Hulu. And then Hulu would pop up and she'd be like, Xbox, play Veggie Tales or something like that. Mm-hmm. And so she walks up to the TV that we have. We don't have an Xbox. We don't have any of this voice tech at the house mm-hmm. that we were living in at the time. And she goes, Xbox, Hulu. And I'm like, sweetheart, we don't have an Xbox. And she's like, oh, what do you have? I'm like, we have a Nintendo 64. And she looks at the TV and she goes, Nintendo 64, Hulu. <laughs> oh. I just, I just, oh oh bless moments, her heart the moments that we have with the kids in our lives totally worthwhile it right it, it does i mean it just in my my younger kids you know dollars talking to alexa going up and learn how to use uh use alexa and it's like right. my god you know, now we're at the point where our our kids, at, at, when we were young, well, I mean, I'm a bit older than you, but, you know, at, at five, the first piece of technology I touched was setting up the VCR for, for the family. But now at that age, our kids are talking, using smartphones, able to work Alexa and just growing up used to that, the voice command thing. So, so yeah, okay, I, I can totally see a personal transporter being in your pocket and just be like, here you go. You mean you have to use your hands? It's like a baby's toy. <laughs> uh, yes. 1989, they were saying that, and here we are 30 years later, and they're doing it. Yeah, yeah, that was, that's from uh, Back to the Future, too. Yeah, <laughs> and that was Elijah Wood, too. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah that's right. Um, all right, so back to why we're all oh, here. Oh, yeah, let's get back to the show. Sorry. <laughs> um, we, uh, we got, we, Saru got the personal transporter. We flash back to Discovery. It's been a little bit of time. Systems are repaired. The communications are repaired. Defense systems are still down. Sensors are partially functional. Shields are good. Um, Det- Detmer reports engines are good. Um, but Discovery is not really supposed to be able to take off from a planet like this. And Saru's like, yeah, I know, I know, but we don't really have a choice. And the ship is trying to lift up and the ice is growing around it. And there's this struggle between the ship and the ice. Mm -hmm. What did you, what did you feel? What did you feel was going to happen there? Was, were you just like, oh, it's Star Trek. They'll eventually break free. It'll be fine. Some urgency. What were you thinking? Well, so so a couple of thoughts with that. The first one was I kind of have a problem with this seemingly random junction box replacing a ribbon cable being what gets the ship back online. I was, I was not a big fan of that, that it just seemed like there is no way that the bottleneck is like that, that, that this, this one little thing, this, this little freaking IDE cable looking thing needs to be swapped out to get the ship running again. I, I'm, you know, I, I get that there is, there's, there's the plot, there's the moments you design these character interactions around this thing. You've got to send a guy into a Jeffrey's tube to, to do this repair, but I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm having a very hard time buying that. Uh, you know, this, this is, this is the, the WAN cable that if you cut it, you've completely taken off internet connection for your, for your entire office kind of thing, which sure there is that there, there is definitely that, but it's not, it's not up in a, in a ceiling tile where you have to, you know, recrimp the end of a RJ 45, uh, uh, cable to, um, I'm sorry, you know, RJ 45 in on a network cable to get your building up and running again, it, it's going to be in like a distinct place, whatever was broken that was going to restore power like that to the ship 
should have been in main engineering. It should have been some bigger, more meaningful thing or, or part. So on, from, from a technical perspective, and I, I know that this is whenever, whenever I watch something with, with a friend or, or, or whatnot that like gets into the, uh, the IT ish realm of, of things, that's where I start picking apart. Like, come on, you know, it's the same thing with two people using the same keyboard to try to stop a hack. That is absolutely not how things work. So when I see this, I just say, no, nah, that's a little, I, I wasn't really jiving with, with that, but okay. Be that as it may, you know, just push that aside. Um, my, my thought there was, I thought they were going to be able to, to break free. I was, I was surprised that this, this ice, this parasitic ice could overpower the, the, because this this ship this massive ship weighs you know i don't know 11 million Thousands tons or whatever tons. Yeah. yes um has thrusters that would have gotten it off the ground and into space so you think about the the force and the power that it would have to have to do that but you have this uh this this organism that is able to keep keep bringing keep bringing the ship down and and pulling it down to the down to the ground to keep it from taking off i just thought ooh, wow that is that is pretty strong i was i did not see that coming um but then you know the, the other part was like okay well what about what about your phasers you, you know i mean start shooting your phasers out to but maybe maybe that was a, a bit on the unrealistic, unrealistic side. Um, so I thought, okay, someone's going to come in and, and, and save them. That's the only way I see them getting out of this because they, they, they can't take off. Yeah, I was, I was struggling. I was like, what's going to happen here? Because, um, you know, they're struggling, they're struggling. And I'm thinking like, you know, the friction, for the, maybe the ship's hull needs to heat up enough to be able to give them a, a little bit more oomph to melt this ice while they're trying to move out of it. I didn't even think about phasers. And, you know, maybe it was Detmer that said that uh, phasers, you know, defense systems weren't actually all there yet. Mm -hmm. um, but... Um, you know, uh, they, they, they're pulling up, they're pulling up and then they get a notification. Like as soon as the communications comes online, they're like, we're being hailed and there's a ship coming in yeah. and somebody speculates it's Zara's competitors. It's those people that we hinted at earlier that were like, they detected discovery. Now they're coming to claim her. Mm -hmm. And so everybody on the ship is like, shit, 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 shit. <laughs> um, and for me, it lingered way too long on Saru's decision what are we going to do? We know Saru. We know him well enough to be like, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to access the hill. That's what you're going to do. You're going to, you're going to pick up the hill. What is that? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what else was Saru going to do? Like you can't right. really fight your way out. You're stuck in ice. Uh, yeah. Uh, like you're being hailed. There's nothing right. else for you and, to really be able to do. Answer the so, damn phone. Yeah. I was like, I wrote down like it shouldn't take this long to answer a hail. <laughs> um, but then as soon as my brain caught up with me, like I was in the moment and my brain caught up with me and was like, okay, what's going to happen here because of the way this plot is rolling out. What is the, the, the director's intention of this scene lingering? And I'm like, Oh, it's Burnham. And oh, you called Burnham. it before you saw her, huh? Well, yeah, just, you know, my, my brain, not, I, I remember distinctly, my brain knocked on my head and was like, hey, pull yourself out of the moment for a second. Mm -hmm. Why would, why would the, the producers and the editors and the directors make this decision to have this moment linger unless it wasn't for some kind of dramatic opening? You're at the end of the episode. We're not going to have a two-parter where it actually is Zara or his people. Who's mm -hmm. it going to be? And my brain was like, oh, it's Michael. And then okay. she pops on the screen. She's got the long hair. It's, it's on, on point. Yep. Oh, and yeah. we find out it's been a year. It's yep. been a year since the last episode. Uh, it's 3089 now. Mm -hmm. Discovery is finally reunited with Michael. We're going to see next week that, that welcoming back, that welcoming home party, what yes. that's like. And um, 
you know, like I said in for episode one, I'm still super interested in what's going to happen uh, this season. I I I'm very excited to see uh, a trek beyond this final frontier. Well, and I'm I'm glad that they are doing doing some things that are a, a, a little bit a little bit uncomfortable, a little bit unconventional. Like we've by the time we get to the second episode, we've had a character that was already in some fashion of you know, it's been a year. It's been a year already, so we've got a time jump from the events of the first episode <clears throat> to now. So now it's not just, well, what has happened in the last 930 years or what has happened since the burn? Now we've got what has been going on this this past year that uh, that, that Michael's been searching for, for discovery. And so we, we've got things that are kind of unconventional that are happening, uh, that, are, that are happening because now she's um, an extra year older than everyone else, you know, which, which is a, a minor thing, but it's like, that's, that's what, that's how time travel screws with you. You know, so suddenly, uh, you know, there's, there's stuff like that. It was, it's kind of like, kind of like the blink and um, or, or uh, the blip in Spider-Man uh, far from home because, you know, everyone comes back, but they came back how they were, five years ago um, from the snap. So you've got, you, you've, you've got people that were, um, what, what's his name? Um, I can't remember the guy's name, but remember they were on the plane and the, the, the one kid was like drinking, drinking alcohol. And, uh, and Peter was like, he's really 16. And he tried oh, to say that, that was flash. You're right. Right. Flash. Like, you, you know, he's, it's been five years. He was supposed to be 21, but technically, ah, you know, so, so, <laughs> so we have, we have an episode of star Trek called far from home where, where Michael blips, uh, which is, which is also you know, something that happened in far from home as we see what happened after the blip. Like, right, right. Yeah. Turned after Iron Man's sacrifice. All yeah. right, so because he, for, for the concept. that and that's the thing that I'm anxious for them to explore is just from Discovery's perspective. They came, they went through the wormhole, and then we're we're heading straight for a planet. That that's their perspective. Yeah. Um, but then they find out that that Michael, it's been a year for her. And that's what time travel does to you. You know, it, it, it's going to screw with you and that stuff like that happens. And we talked about this last week, just with, you know, how, how far apart are they and what does that relate to in regards to when they show up? Yeah. Now, um, I, I think if, if, if I were the writers, I may have a year is comfortable. A year is nice and comfortable. I, I would have maybe, why not make it two? Why, why not? Why not make it that that there was a, a span of two years that Michael was doing, you know, what, whatever on or around the planet, looking for, waiting for discovery to to show up. But you know, it it, it is what it is. Um, in in regards to to this episode, I really liked the balance of the uh, the humor that we, that we got from, uh, from the crew, those, those actual relatable human moments. And what I also liked was the, the old fashioned Trek feel of this, where we have a problem we have to solve and every person plays their, their part yeah. towards this goal. The, the team were kind of thing very, very much, uh, a TOS kind of thing, very much next generation where we, we have to fix a thing and everyone's got their part to do. Yeah. Uh, you know, everyone's involved and it's like in, in beyond you've, everybody's got their role. They have to, they have to play in teamwork to get, to accomplish, to accomplish that, uh, that goal. And that was the, the same with this. We've got this little, little device. We've got to get fixed. We've got to go into town and you know find find parts 
to get that done. And each person has something that they've got to do to help get the ship going again. So I like those. I like those, those teamwork, all hands on board episodes where everybody gets, uh, you know, has, has a, has a piece to play in that. So. Yeah. How about you? Um, I like what I like the the fact that this episode focused on so many different people. It gave everybody their spotlight. I didn't feel like it 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 overdid it. And coming out of Lower Decks, it feels a little slower actually, because Lower Decks was twenty four minutes of to the wall, just mm. action, dialogue, things are happening. You had to watch it two or three times to really see all the things. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I I really liked about this episode was it did feature Saru and Tilly in a situation we really hadn't seen them in before, and it gave Giorgio the spotlight in just the right way. And Tig and Stamets have been your dry wit characters the whole time, and they haven't really had an extended moment together, which was a lot of fun. We got some mm-hmm. relationships. We plot some seeds for the future. We, you know, Detmer, what's what's going on with Detmer? Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, they're already making enemies with Zara and his people and other of his competitors. So they're they're establishing a lot here up front that I hope doesn't get forgotten as the season goes by. Right. And we're supposed to get uh, some more character development out of uh, out of the the, the rest of the <clears throat> uh, the main crew, and th- that that was the thing about Discovery that I think was for me. And I don't know about about you, but the hardest thing to get used to was just we have had uh, you know by, by the time Discovery was out, we were we were around the fiftieth. Um, anniversary of, of Trek, or, uh, you know, 50 plus in all that time, we had the captain, the first officer, the, this person, the, that person, we knew their names. They had this station on the bridge. They were in the conference room. They had these scenes. Then we get to discovery and it kind of like upends that where you go, you go through even most of the first season and don't know who anyone is outside of uh, the, the captain, the first officer, uh, you know, uh, uh, Michaels, Stamets, the, the show is about people in positions that you're not used to. Like, okay, the, the main characters of the show are, we, we didn't have a chief engineer, you know, it's, it's like, okay, we need a chief engineer, we need a transporter chief, we don't have that. We, we've got this, this scientist and this person who was, who's drummed out of the fleet as the main characters and you know the captain ends up being a bad guy and it was just it was an unconventional way of of showing the characters that we hadn't seen before because everyone had that distinct thing um and really didn't feel like it it felt like it wasn't until season two that these these people on the bridge these nameless people started getting their you know even names instead of just yeah. being uh you know the the dude over there and the, the girl that sits there and and whatnot um so from from what i've what i've heard in the past is that this season is is actually going to put some of that time into the the other characters and now you know we're not going to get the um those bottle episodes of this is a Troy episode. This is a, a, a Jordy episode. They're, they're not, you know, we're not going to get a Detmer episode per se. We're not going to get, uh, an, an, uh, um, I can't, uh, a Wusikon. It, you know, it's not going to quite be like that, but however, these characters are going to be interacting more. They're not just going to be nameless people at bridge stations. And so I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm glad that they're starting to put in that effort of, all right, let's start, let's start getting these characters in because we paid no attention to them for about like the first season and a half of this show. Yeah, I'm, I'm on board with that line of thinking, Jay, the first two seasons, they, they had some, they had some production difficulties and this third season Mm -hmm. feels like it's kicking off really nicely. 
Um, I'm looking forward to seeing how they tie in personal stories with season long continuity. I think they're doing a better job than they did on DS nine in that respect. Mm -hmm. DS nine did have season continuity stories, but they were sort of interrupted with these personal stories for the characters. Um, and they didn't really tie in a personal arc over the main arc, which is what discovery is, is better at doing. Yes. Um, and discovery gets a lot of flex. So I'm hoping that season three can turn, turn it around and, and don't pardon the pun, but correct, write the ship. Yes. Yes, right absolutely. Ship. So, uh, why don't we tell our listeners where they can, they can find us. I mean, we're, we're everywhere, but, uh, yeah. Um, so if you've listened this far, thank you so much. You yes, are you. the best part of beyond track podcast. Um, if you are looking to hang out with us, you can find us on Twitter at beyond Trek pod. Uh, if you're listening to us, you can watch us on YouTube at beyond Trek productions. We do have some pretty cool visuals and we like to think we're funny sometimes. <laughs> um, you can hang out with us on Facebook at beyond Trek productions as well. If you'd like to support us on Patreon, you can go to www.patreon.com slash beyond Trek. And speaking of patrons, there's two people that I really want to send thanks to stephanie baker and james cook for supporting beyond track podcast these many months uh without you our editing would not be as uh rewarding um <laughs> crisp it, 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 yeah no it just it takes a lot of time to edit two hour episodes especially if you want to put cool stuff in them yeah um so yes, please do go to Patreon and support us. Every little bit helps us give, give you better visual quality. It improves our equipment and gives you better audio quality. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if you help us enough, we might be able to hire, hire professional joke writers so that we can be funnier than we think we are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't that be something? <laughs> um, yeah. So for everything else, tune in next time for discovery season three episode three um and until then thank you for going boldly with beyond track podcast we are beyond track podcast lower your inhibitions and surrender your years we will add inspirational and hilarious track content to your day your attention will adapt to subscribe to us resistance is futile <laughs>